Andrew Hebda has been the curator of zoology at the Nova Scotia Museum since 1995. He is responsible for zoological collection, which includes about half of a million cataloged specimens. He is a researcher on natural history topics with approximately 80 publications. He is also a columnist and public speaker along with teaching at St. Mary's University. Andrew knows his ticks, and today he's going to be speaking on ticks. How do they really make a living, and why most aren't an issue for Lyme? Please join me in welcoming Andrew Hebda. Oh, hang on, hang, hang on. This, they always do this at the shows. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with Dr. Seuss, this is going to be more of an I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees, I speak for the bushes, and the swamp swami fish. So this is really to give you a bit of a perspective of what you're going to encounter, what you may encounter, how they're making a living, and what you can do about it. Now, I, I'm guessing that most of the people here either would have been exposed to ticks, are looking forward to being exposed to ticks, or, or would prefer not to be exposed to ticks. So hopefully this will give you some information that you can use when you're dealing with them. So, let's talk ticks. Notice I live in the past, I work in a museum. In a museum what we do is we record time and place. When's the first time something was seen in an area? and where was it seen, and or when is the last time. So this story of ticks really fits into that mode because although we do have ticks here, we've had ticks for perhaps centuries, some are more contemporary, and some are extremely recent. So uh, it fits into the type of work that we do. This is our friend. Uh, this is not to scale, by the way. It's a bit larger than normal. It's an electron micrograph. Was there a little pointer thingy? No, there wasn't. Okay, pretend I'm pointing. Actually, if this, was, uh, if this was an overhead projector, I'd do my little duck imitations. Anyways, this is an electron micrograph blowing up a female black-legged tick. And the things I want you to pay attention to are, number one, we can tell it's a female, and I think that's going to be covered in part with the uh, presentation from Dalhousie University. Number two, they don't have a head. What they have is some feeding parts, essentially a thing that sticks through the skin called a hypostome, and a couple of palps that help it attach. And then they have a whole suite of legs. And where we smell, or we sense with our noses, ticks sense essentially with their feet. And we'll cover that in a few minutes. So, how many species do we have here? We got lots. We're doing really good. Of the specimens that have been introduced, that have been brought to the museum, we have 20 species. Of those 20 species, 14 are established here. Of those 14 that are established here, four are very common. So if you look at the top, you can essentially see we're looking at the wood tick, we're looking at the rabbit tick, we're looking at groundhog tick, and the black-legged, or what used to be called the deer tick. And at the same time, we have a whole suite of other species uh, present, not in large numbers. We have very little information on their distributions. Uh, they may have implications with for disease, but not necessarily for Lyme. And I'm guessing perhaps you'll be talking about some of them, or when you're doing okay. So there'll be that'll be covered later on. We have some exotics that we've picked up from people who have traveled. And some of them are a little bit more high profile. So one, for example, is the Lone Star Tick. And that one we have seven records in the last 25 years. And uh, so they've all come as adults, off travelers. And the rest of them either coming with tourists or coming with rescue dogs. So the whole rescue dog issue, uh, we just received some two weeks back that had both a Gulf Gulf Coast uh, tick, as well as a brown dog tick species that, again, we occasionally will see brought in, but not often. So these are not established here, to the best of our knowledge. Most common, these four. And if you just take a look at them, these are all females. By the way, except for the, ba the teenage portion or the nymph portion, this is all a woman thing. I'm going to get letters to the editor. So these are all females here, and you can see in just across the board, and how you identify them will be done later on by uh, the student from Dalhousie. We have a groundhog tick, which is fairly common. We have the black-legged tick. These are all unfed a dog tick or the wood tick, and one which is very, very small, 
but probably distributed across the province, and that's called the rabbit tick. Although we don't have rabbits, we have snowshoe hare, but that's the problem when animals can't read what we've written about them. This one we do not have here, and this is the one that's had fairly high profile in the, in the news the last little while. This one's present, established now in portions of southern Maine. Uh, it has been reported from south southwest Nova Scotia, but uh, we haven't confirmed that, and the specimens that were reported as being that. This is the lone star tick, adult female. Uh, those ones were actually were, were dog ticks. Okay, quick and dirty. Males versus females. Uh, essentially, this looking at adults, uh, when a, a tick is hatched, of course, it forms what's called a larva, which transforms into a nymph and into an adult. Now, I'll get into those in a moment, but if you're looking at adults, which are the ones that we're most likely to see, uh, the adult males will not feed and expand. They will attach. Uh, they will look for a place where the females are going to be anticipated to arrive uh, and at the time when they do appear, they let go. So because of that, if you look at the back, so they are on your stage left, I have to think about that. Good thing I don't, we're not doing high counting of the shoes that have to come off. And it's got a shield on the back, it's called a scutum, and you'll notice that it covers the whole body. With a female, and this applies to all the species, the scutum or that little shield only covers the fore part of the body because in part to facilitate the expansion when that adult is feeding. You don't see that kind of an expansion in the juvenile stages at all. So essentially, if you see one, the shield covers the whole back, it's a male. If it covers part of the back, irrespective of the shape and color, it's a female. Now with the black-legged tick, those are the four stages. Now, the people at McDonald's don't like this because we don't call them deer ticks, we don't call them black-legged ticks, we call them BLTs. And you can identify the stage by going to McDonald's. They hatch out of an egg into a larva, and the larva has six legs. It is the size of a poppy seed. Ta-da, McDonald's. Well, okay, Tim Hortons maybe too. Once that has fed, now that, those animals, there appears to be no transmission via the eggs to the, to the larvae. Once they, once they feed, they get a blood meal, they will transform into a nymph, which is the size of a poppy seed, of a uh, sesame seed, rather. It doesn't matter if they're brown or the yellow. So that's the size. And then, of course, once you look at the adults, once they've transformed, uh, they can be a variable size, depending on whether they fed or not. And you'll notice that the male, who is in the middle, looks quite different from the female. And initially, it was described as a different species, because you look at the, the shield or the scutum on the back, you look at the palps, it's quite different in appearance from the female. So those are the four stages that we have. When do we find them? The question is, okay, we're just coming off of tick season. Every season is tick season. Temperatures above four degrees centigrade, they're active. We've got tick submissions from every month of the year. In one particular year, we had phenomenal submissions even at the beginning of January, and then nothing at all until May. That was three winters ago, remember? No ground frost, and then we got a meter and a half of snow on the 3rd of January, and it kept on building. That year, the ground didn't freeze. We were doing some pasture work. My wife and I live on a farm. Uh, the ground temperature immediately under the snow stayed at four degrees. So there was protection, no frost, and of course when the first blush of migrating birds came through, there was no predation either. So essentially, the ticks did very well. Basic function, basic, basic thing you should pick up here, starting with eggs, assuming they are laid now, they will hatch into larvae soon. Uh, those larvae then will be feeding in uh, the summer on small hosts. Uh, they're small, they don't climb very high in the structure, uh, so they tend to be found in grasses, possibly short shrubs. They will then nominally overwinter to the following year, transforming into nymphs, who will then feed on larger animals because in structure they will use a larger, larger type of a habitat. And then, of course, uh, we are exposed to those ones uh, as adults in the fall over the winter. So essentially, you're looking at several seasons for that particular animal to go from egg, essentially, to egg. So it's quite a prolonged cycle, and it's dependent on those hosts. Now, very quickly, how do they get established? Looking at one that we're using as a model, the dog ticks. Dog ticks were absent from the province. They were introduced in 1896 with hunting dogs in Shelburne County. 
uh, in the 1940s, an active sampling regime was taken, undertaken to see distribution. And so you can see in 10-year increments that essentially the distribution would increase. Now what we're seeing here is not the ability of the ticks to move, because if I was a tick here at the end of the season, with luck, I might make it to Brenda maybe a little bit further. But what we're seeing is the dynamics, the distribution, the movement of their hosts. So essentially in a case like this, principal host would be something like a deer, it could be foxes, and of course nowadays we have uh, coyotes as well. Now, by the next sampling period, you can see we're picking up another pattern showing up. We're seeing extensions, it's no longer radiation, so if you're familiar with Nova Scotia, you can see the Chester Road there, you can see in along the coast. And by the time we did a follow-up, the first comprehensive survey since that was finished, uh, it's no longer deer being the main thing moving around, but they're following what we call in the military communication corridors. So we are now moving the animals around. And uh, since then, I have one more map you'll be able to see. See the little red dots all over the place? Any idea what those are? Roadside picnic parks. You can overlay with that campgrounds. Now the thing to remember, is that each of those dots, each place where they start, they'll start radiating out in the same kind of a manner. Now, we're just finishing up the, the mapping of the species. We have a student from, the, from uh, the community college doing that for us, and those maps should be available within about a month or so. But essentially, this being the dog tick, you can see draw line, county line, you, they've extended, they've expanded pretty well throughout the whole province in that period of roughly 130 years. So they're expanding, they're radiating out from that first spot. So this is classic, uh, classic tick habitat, picnic grounds. If you ever go to Stuyak, the home of Marvin the Mastodon, uh, they have a Tim Hortons, back and behind, they have a dog park, sort of. Lovely trails, tall grass. We haven't sampled there, that's on the list. Sample on your way back. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion we'll find a lot more species there uh, than, uh, than we would have anticipated because everybody goes there. So once they're established to spread, they have to be spread by a host. So in this case, I've just put a generic mammal host and it's a coyote, uh, but it could be any kind of a host. So they're the ones that move it around. They themselves are not going to go far. If there weren't any mobile mammal hosts, for example, they wouldn't shift. Having said that, we also have a second type of host with a hotter signature, which is called a bird. Bird temperatures, body temperatures are a little bit warmer than people's. The stronger sign signature, if they're queuing on heat, they will be moved by that. And we suspect the, the BLTs have been shifted primarily or introduced by birds. How do we determine distribution? We look for them. Uh, dragging sheets, the standard method, 50 centimeters by one, one meter, drag it behind you, and essentially over a set distance, the ticks will get knocked off the grass. They do not jump, they do not fly. I'm gonna, re Brenda told me to remind you, they do not jump, they do not fly, okay? They're climbing, they get dislodged, and that's how you find them. So that's method one, and the passive method, which has been our principal one in the last little bit, and it could be doctor's clinics, it could be veterinary clinics, and I think most of the work from at Dalhousie is being done using veterinary clinics, is that correct? Getting half a nod, so okay, I'm sure they'll tell us. So these are submissions, we don't go out for them, they come to us. Based on those sources, essentially we're looking at the mid-1990s when the first flag-legged ticks appeared, and that was in Lunenburg, downtown Lunenburg, right downtown, first, second peninsula. And most of the one in the first, first year came off of one dog. There were over 300 black legged ticks off that one dog. It was a great sampling technique. The following year, they appeared over the whole province. We had two major tropical storms. And it's just as if somebody took a shotgun and blasted the province and bang, 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 bang. We had 35 separate locations where they were established. And we assume that those will be basically loci for extension from that point. So, essentially, using the old mapping that Department of Health and Wellness had, uh, they used to have something like that showing uh, these circles with uh, basically 50 kilometers across around hotspot areas, saying if you're in those areas, you, have a, a, you should be aware that Lyme may be present. Uh, Brenda's kind of semi-smiling because this, this is the map that was used up until two years back. However, I've just put it up because overlaying what we've got with submissions, uh, this is strictly black-legged ticks. 
that is where we had black legged exhibitions up until that point. So you can see, yes, it was more or less confined within those areas, but again, these are ones that people have brought to us. We haven't looked for them, so they're present elsewhere. But look at the whole Northumberland shore. We had, we had ticks from the area just west of Anaganish, and we know there are people positive for Lyme there. We also had a whole suite of ticks from hospitals at Pugwash, Amherst, and some at Spring Hill, and I think in the area in around Malagash uh, as well. So uh, a lot of ticks from there, and we also know that there were a number of positive Lyme cases there. Now, what the Department of Health and Wellness have done, this is last year's, well actually this is the map until a week, uh, until last Monday. Uh, they changed it from occurrence and a radius to the county and the presence. So essentially the code is if it's pale, it means that you've got a lowest risk. Uh, it means the ticks may be there. S middle color, middle shade is uh, presence of ticks, but uh, no disease, they're established, and blue is ticks, and the disease is established. And then of course, as of this last Monday, they updated it to that. So essentially includes all of the counties, but keeping in mind that this is reflecting somewhere within that county, we had those criteria were matched. Uh, based on the, their information, Guysboro is shown as middle and Cape Breton is shown as low risk or lower risk. We've had quite a few submissions from Cape Breton, but they've all been uh, adults. So uh, we can't comment on whether or not they may be established or not, but there are some very, very active areas in Cape Breton that regularly put them in. Now, this is the latest data from, from uh, Health Canada, from the lab in Winnipeg, and they're basically saying in an area where Lyme is established, within the black leg of ticks, 40% are, 40% uh, carry Lyme, okay? Uh, two years ago, the number was 30%, okay? So they're updating those numbers, and you may have some more reflective information based on, based on the work that you are doing. But this is coming from the Lindsay Lab, okay? Uh, I am not a doctor. I am not an epidemiologist. I am a, a humble naturalist and a farmer. My wife, oh, there she is, and a married farmer. Uh, so I only can pass on the information that's given to us and report on what we're doing. Now, how do we get them? How do we come in contact with them? What are they doing? They're trying to make a living. The ticks have no evil intent. They don't want to kill us. They don't want to annoy us. They want that feed so they can transform and they can ripen the eggs. Same thing with mosquitoes and black flies and deer flies. Now, this is where I have to be open and make an admission. I don't get bitten by mosquitoes. I don't get bitten by horse flies or black flies. My wife does. I don't. And I don't pick up ticks. So if I go with somebody through the woods, we'll walk through the shrubbery or whatever, I won't get any ticks. I may get one or two on my outside, but never on the inside. That's why I always take a tick magnet with me, somebody who's good at picking them up. So what they're doing is at each of the stages, they'll climb up on a piece of structure. Now notice eight legs. Front legs are out. They're questing. They're sniffing. They're checking the air, looking for presence. If you have a live one, in, live one with you, stick it on a table and just put a finger up near it, and you'll see it, it'll be questing, and you'll see it turn and quest and start moving towards you. Okay, that's how they're detecting people that are people or potential hosts. With black leg ticks, this one unfortunately was shot after uh, with, a, with a twig that was moved. Dog ticks quest upwards, black leg ticks quest downwards, but most people usually aren't looking for that. And this is why, going back to this image, you have their sniffers. The sniffers are on their legs, and uh, this is something you've probably noticed. If you have a tick walking along, it's walking along on its, on its wrists and on its ankles. They're not attached. You annoy it or you approach it, it clamps down with the claws. If you're working in the woods, it's called a dog down, and they're hard to pick off. They're not attached, they're just holding on. You let go, and then they'll keep on walking again. So it's kind of a neat mechanism, and then they'll go back to walking on the ticks. But look at that little pit over there on the leg, over on your right side. Essentially, that's where they have their sensory mechanisms, and they can detect chemicals, uh, chemical cues and physical cues. So those are their eyes. You find them on their legs. And uh, they can detect a variety of materials. Now, I've worked with a variety of other biting insects. Uh, some of them are very specific on what they're cueing on. Others are quite generalists. Essentially, moisture, heat. Uh, they can cue on ammonia. They can cue on lactic acid. 
uh, and, um, and as well moisture. So essentially they respond to that and if you dislodge them or whatever, that's what they're looking for. If they get dislodged off a twig, have to climb up again, it's a lot of energy wasted, so they want to be quick and efficient. Possible hosts. Now, some hosts are dead-end hosts. In other words, that uh, it's not a host in which the disease will develop, uh, nor one from which somebody else can uh, pick up the disease or another tick. Speaking as a farmer, I treat all animals as individuals. They're people, like us, trying to make a living. So these are the hosts that facilitate the distribution. But as I said earlier on, it could be any mammal. So depending on the stage of development, uh, size. Now, I am assuming that we'll find them on these. It's on the list. You have? Okay. Great. That saves me having to stop at the side of the road on the way home. Okay. Yeah. The very first animal that I did worked on in the museum in Ottawa was one of those. It took me about two weeks to get all of the blood to stop flowing and the feeling in my fingers. Sorry? We suggest you don't pat them. And then at the lower stages, you're looking at smaller animals. And ultimately, from the point of view of disease reservoirs, these are probably the most important. Certainly, they are within the northeastern states, so it's that complex of the deer mice and the white-footed mice. And in part, because the earlier stages don't climb high, and so things such as nymphs, which are probably the more significant stage, are more likely to be feeding on those. So we have those here. You won't find both species in one place, but certainly most places you will. Notice the characteristics, big eyes, big ears, and sort of the dusky, dusky back on them. They're the ones that crap inside your, your knife, fork, and spoon uh, drawer and, uh, back at the camp or the cabin. So they're probably more important than deer. People say we got lots of deer, could be a problem. Well, if the deer are there, you got a great chance then for moving the disease further out or it be having it introduced, but if they're not critical. Less common hosts, agricultural animals. Why? They got a thick hide. Write that down, thick hide. That'll be in Anatomy 201 since she's going to vet school. Uh, the thing that they stick through the body, through the skin, is called a hypostome. It's not very long. It has to penetrate through the skin into tissues where they can get serum. So the back haunches, you don't get them. Although, ears, lips, and of course, in around the eyes. So uh, that's a reason. Horses aren't a problem because they, they can get Lyme, but it only affects their, their joints, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Only. Um, other animals, no, these, these aren't ours, but uh, we're sheep farmers. Large dogs like that have very thick fur. You, rarely, you will not find them on the skin, but you'll find them on the nose, on the lips, possibly on the eyes. Rarely do you find them on sheep. Now, we're sheep farmers. We're in a couple of associations. We were looking all over the place. Sheep have, their bellies are mostly like ours. Well, not quite like ours, mine's hairy. But the point is that they have hair and they have a bit of wool, but they also produce what's called wool fat or lanolin. They have two glands back in here, and that spreads through. And it's, it looks like it's a perfect place for them to set in, but you never find them there. Lanolin is acidic. There's probably some other features to it. It's a complex organic. And so based on that, there could be something that dissuades them from there. So within sheep, the only place we've seen them on sheep has been on lips. So uh, possibly. And of course, this is the other host here, although he's dressed not too badly for, for, uh, for tick country. So essentially any animal that has warm blood and will allow, have the proteins available to allow for both uh, of, uh, transfer from one stage to the other uh, is perfectly valid. Now, quick and dirty anatomy, they don't cover this at vet school, okay? Essentially, this is the insides of an adult, and what I draw, want to draw to your attention are a couple things. Number one is the palps on the top. So the palps, the two things on either side of the straw, they will anchor in with that, and I'll show you how in a moment. But look in here in the gut, the red portion. So the red portion, you have these four gut pouches. Uh, we can identify, you can readily see them in an animal that hasn't fed or has started to feed. So based on the fullness of that, we can get an estimate as to how long it's been attached. You have the mid-gut, which is sort of in the middle of that red thing. That's the place where the Borrelia sets up and parks itself. It doesn't reproduce. It basically sits there in a waiting, waiting mode until such time as the animal gets the blood meal, and then it starts to reproduce. So essentially, that animal becomes an incubation chamber. Then you get transference through the gut wall into the hemocoel, and then migrating up into the salivary glands. And then they re-inoculate with, uh, re with the saliva. 
And at the same time, of course, if you have the gut contents in large numbers, then of course you may also get potential re-inoculation by forcing those gut contents back. Now this is what brings us to the first problem, and that has to do with when you're taking them off. Ticks, unlike insects, uh, have breathing tubes that all come out in one place. If you go back to your basic biology, they don't have lungs. Insects don't. They have tubes that go through the body, little holes on each segment called spiracles, and that's how they get their gas transfer. But with ticks, essentially because the females will be expanding, they all come out in single plates, and you can see in a blown up image there, okay, that's where they all come out. And the old wisdom was, cover those holes that can't breathe, and they drop off, and the answer is yes, they do. But before they do that, they also empty the gut contents. Okay, not a good idea. How have we seen people dealing with them? Don't do that. Because, yeah, it'll work. They'll let go. But you're elevating the risk. And this next one is the one that I'm really disturbed about because we do get the specimens coming in from sick kids that are big lighters. Three weeks ago, I got a sample from sick kids, and they apologized that it didn't have any legs because the parents used the lighter to get it to remove. Again, don't do that. Will it regurgitate? In all likelihood. Shouldn't be smoking. I have no idea what you're going to do as a 2nd of July, though. Okay, so the main point is you want to retain, if you're removing one, you don't want to take the risk of inoculating anything. Even if it doesn't have lime or anything like that, you've got gut contents, it's like having a bad dirty sliver or a bad paper cut. So preferably don't do it. Uh, in this case, you're looking at one there. If you look, remember I mentioned the pouches? See the pouches in the back? You can see the four, four starting to appear. This animal has been feeding probably about 12 hours. So you want to keep the insides inside. Somebody said, oh my God, they're boring right in. They're going under the skin. No, one little thing goes in the skin. That's that hypostome. I'll show you a picture of the hypostome in palps. But that can then turn into that. Saying, oh, it's drilling in. No, it isn't. It's on the surface. Okay, that animal's been feeding probably around 48 hours, 72 hours. Black like ticks are a bit different in that they don't stay on the host as long as other species, but certainly the the 72 hours plus a little bit is probably the, the ballpark. So, and this is something that Brenda alluded, brought to my attention when I gave a talk in New Glasgow. Uh, how do they attach that makes them so hard to let go? This is a dog tick on, on the left and a black legged tick. They secrete a bio cement. That cement then anchors in place in the skin because they're not holding on with muscles, they're not holding on with anything else. They're just glued in place and with a dog tick, you notice the bio cement is basically spread along the surface of the tick, what, uh, surface of the skin. Once they finish feeding, they reverse that bio cement and then they let go. There's work being done in Vienna right now. They're trying to isolate, oh, 10, I'm a 10, thank you. I've just been told I'm a 10. You hear that, hear that Gwen? I am a 10. Okay, I think that's what you meant to say, was it? Uh, so essentially they're looking to harvest that cement because that is a compound that may have utility in medical, medical work. Now this gets us to the problem. What are they putting into us or onto us? We know they're putting an analgesic because you don't feel when they're attached. They're there. You might feel them walking. So they're putting one protein analgesic. They don't want it to clot up the blood because then they can't drink. So they're putting an anticoagulant, two compounds, two proteins. They're putting in an anti-inflammatory because they don't want it to swell up and block the tube three proteins, plus a cement. That's what we know of. What else are they adding in? We don't know. What is the impact of that on the body? We don't know. Removal, I'll just quickly flip through. These are fine, they all work. Uh, can Lime does have these lovely kits available that, are, that have the thing. Somebody said, don't use the one that screws them out because it makes them dizzy and then they go and they bring up. They don't have an inner ear. They don't get dizzy. So essentially crowbar them off and off they come. Where? Okay. Any squeamish people here? Okay. Hard to get good pictures. Actually, lots easy to get good pictures online, but not the ones we wanted. With black-legged ticks, they tend to be specific. This is not the exclusive places you find them, but this is generally where you will find them. Essentially, in places where you have protection, you have heat and moisture. Thinking back, if they're acting as a crucible where the bacterium is growing, they're looking for those conditions that'll help them grow. The warmer the temperatures, the faster they'll go. When our little boy was a little boy, he's a veterinarian, he doesn't use that word now, he called this the armbo. But essentially, as you can see, places where you have protection, knees, 
uh, armpits, ar uh, elbows, under the breast line. Yes, men, we do have breast lines. And then also looking at groin areas, very important. So if you're doing a tick check, these are the places you should check. Uh, most people can check most of them. Don't know about you. I can't see my butt crack. I looked online, lots of pictures of butt cracks, not a single one with a bullseye rash though. So if you're doing a check, that's what you have to check if the BLTs are there. You may see the other ones more readily. If there's a place you can't see, get someone to help you. We'll just do quickly go over that in a moment. And of course, there are images of varied and sundry different ones that you'll see. So who? Black legged ticks, different stages. But the probably the most, most important one because you don't notice it is a nymph. They don't expand in size, so they say roughly the size of a sesame seed. That one you can see has got gut content, so it has already fed. And of course, then the fact that the whole season is a tick season. Quick set of data. This is within where we live in Hans County. The dots on there, red dots, are black-legged ticks, submissions. The uh, blue dots are uh, groundhog ticks, and the yellow stars, rather, are uh, black-legged ticks, and that's based on medical submissions as well as individuals. And now you can see a bias. Nobody goes in the woods or doesn't report it, so that's a problem with our data. Probably not so much with yours because doctors are really late. Any doctors here before I say anything else? Okay, doctors are lazy. When they send a, a tick in for analysis or identification, they don't get any history of travel for the individual, so it makes it difficult to, to georeference the data. Helpers, dogs. Dogs are a problem. They can get, they can certainly come the disease. So essentially, risks, yes, manageable, yes. How? Easy. There are compounds that are licensed for use for tick control. There are some that work that are not licensed, and that's a bit of a problem because with the internet, you can get a lot of stuff. Currently with Health Canada, the things that contain in keratin or DEET are the ones that, uh, that will work, and they recommend that you put them on, expo on exposed pieces of skin. DEET is a problem with kids because you have combinations of DEET and sunscreen, and uh, there are problems with theirs. So you'll notice that there are exclusions for using DEET products and sun, sunblock things for children, infants. Um, second thing, yeah, <laughs> tell your kids to go out in the midsummer and get totally sealed up. Get them a Tyvek suit. Doesn't work. But that will work, because if there's no exposed skin, they can't attach. They climb, they seem to only climb upwards. Uh, with me, hopefully, once they pass the hairline, they'll keep moving and then I'll be free. And check your body for ticks. And anywhere, now that's, that happens to be a dog tick. The, generally, in around the scalp line, it tends to be dog ticks. We have seen some black-legged ticks from in behind the ear as well. And next day, another check. Check your clothes. It's very straightforward. Your powerful, most powerful tool is don't get exposed in the first place. After you're exposed, well, of course, the fact that you're all here is the issue that many people are exposed because that didn't occur. So the whole point is that you've got to check with those, with the proper equipment uh, and with the proper conditions, you can actually monitor for them. You can stop them from attaching. If they're attached, you can bring them in. You can certainly, there's a variety of th at least three places you can de determine what the species is. Of those 14 species we have here at the point, at this point, one is problematic for this. But there are other pathogens and other diseases which uh, our good friends at Dalhousie will cover in a moment. And don't forget these guys. Now, we're an HRM. Remember they've been talking about the cat bylaw? These guys can get bitten. You test their bodies, test their blood, they have antibodies, they've been exposed, but they don't show the clinical symptoms. So by definition, they're a carrier. So I dare you to propose that all cats must be on a leash and must, have, uh, must be treated with vaccines for, for ticks and the like here in town, and I want pictures when you do that before council. Anyways, the whole point is, are they a risk? Yeah, but it's a manageable one. The point is, if you didn't pick them up and you get exposed, that's when we get into issues and problems. And that is why we're here today. Anyways, any questions?